My name is Brendan Scott, and I'm historian in residence with Cavan County Council. And this short webisode will investigate the death of Margaret Livingstone in 1922, probably the most notorious event in Cavan's decade of centenaries period, or certainly one of them at least. But who was Margaret Livingstone and what were the circumstances of her short life and her brutal death? This is what this webisode will discuss. Margaret Sophia Livingstone, was born on the 29th of November, 1908, the daughter of James Livingstone of Ardlohar, which is between kind of Ballyconnell and Kilchandra, and Mary Elizabeth Livingstone near Tom, Nee Thompson, also known as Minnie. James was a native of Ardlohar, and Mary was from uh, Fermanagh. And this is a civil registration of Margaret's death, I say on the 29th of November, 1908, uh, her second name, you can see there's Margaret Sophia, uh, James Livingstone of Ardlover is the father, Mary uh, Livingston, uh, Nee Thompson. Uh, the job that is uh, given to the father here is merchant, and that's he, he is the fellow who's given the information uh, about the birth. Um, uh, James and Mary were uh, married in uh, the Church of Ireland, Church of Ahadrum C, uh, on the 20th of November, 1907. And Margaret came along literally just over 12 months later, 12 months and a few days later. Uh, their fathers were named as John Livingston and William Thompson, who were both farmers. And the marriage was witnessed by William Kenny and Charlotte Thompson. Um, and as I say, just one year uh, uh, following the marriage, uh, Margaret came along. So she was the first child uh, born to them. In the 1911 census, so three years later after uh, Margaret was born, uh, the Livingstons uh, are, are uh, said to be living in the townland of Dring, which is close to Kildallan. And there are four members recorded in Madge's family. Her parents, James and Mary, who we've met already, they were aged 39 and 31 years respectively in 1911. Uh, uh, Margaret herself, who was known in the family as Madge, uh, and her younger brother, William Redmond, who was aged one year, uh, one years old uh, in 1911. Uh, James's occupation uh, at this point had changed from merchant to sub postmaster, and Mary, his wife, was recorded as being um, a, an assistant in the post office. And that said, uh, their census there, you can see them all uh, listed out there. Uh, they also had, you can see the last entry there is a, a young girl called Kate Riley, who was 12 years old. Uh, who was living with them as a domestic servant. Uh, aside from Kate, who was a Catholic, the remainder of the household was noted as being Episcopalian. Uh, Episcopalian was a term that was used frequently at that point by members of the Church of Ireland, especially, as I say, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, as the, a lot of, of the uh, Church of Ireland wished to distinguish themselves from the Church of England, whom they had felt had kind of abandoned them uh, in the light of the, of the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland in 1869. And so they wished uh, to, I suppose, set themselves up or cast themselves uh, as different from Church of England. So you do find in, a, in the 1911 census, particularly, uh, you find a lot of people listing themselves as being Episcopalian rather than uh, Church of Ireland, which is what they were. Um, and on the 14th of November, 1911, uh, not long after the census was taken, James and Mary's third and final child, a girl called Charlotte Florence, was born. So there's three children born uh, to that marriage. And then James and Mary, so there's a, a five, five piece family, as it were. Uh, Mary, uh, the, the mother sadly died on the 2nd of March, 1916, aged only 37 years old from TB. Uh, she'd suffered from the illness for about three months and uh, James, her husband, was present at her death. And it must have been a terrible time of upheaval and uncertainty and grief in the family, uh, for husband and children alike. But on the 22nd of September 1920, James, who is now listed as being 45 years old, married uh, a 27-year-old uh, from Nocadoos which is a townland in Derry Lynn County from Anna. And this was a girl called Mary Ross. Uh, but even though it's a townland in Derry Lynn, uh, the, 
the town land Nacogdoches' name is described in marriage registration as being in Ballyconnell, so it's probably a straddling border there. Uh, the marriage took place in Ballyconnell Parish Church and was witnessed uh, by Mabel Ross and Alexander Berry. Uh, Mary's father, David Ross, was listed as being 78 years old in 1911, nine years previously, and Mary uh, had been living uh, with her parents, uh, two siblings and a niece in the household in 1911, nine years previously. And this marriage between James and Mary uh, would hopefully have given Madge and her siblings some sense of security, and the young girl and her new stepmother do seem to have been close. Uh, a daughter called Anna arrived uh, on the 25th of August, uh, 1921, and Madge seemed to have spent her final days happily and busily and was well known in the nearby town of Ballyconnell, where she cycled every day for music lessons and to pick up newspapers, probably for the shop, because uh, they had a shop as well as, as the post office. Uh, she was later described uh, by the local Church of Ireland rector as a nice and most promising girl. Now, we have to set uh, uh, Madge's life and death in the context of what's going on in Ireland at this time. And the Irish War of Independence, which began in 1919, ended officially with the signing of the truce on uh, the 11th of July, 1921, although violence still continued sporadically uh, throughout the rest of the year. But following the ratification of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in early January, 1922, tensions grew between the pro-treaty and anti-treaty camps. And for a number of years, there had been an increase in attacks on Protestants and Unionists all across Ireland, not just in Cavan. And Cavan, was certainly no exception to this. Uh, the most recent and notable probably of these uh, attacks in Cavan had been that on uh, the gun attack on the home of Travers Blackley, the Farnham estate agent, which had happened on the 8th of April, 1922. And if anyone's interested in that, I, there's an online talk uh, that you can access through the library uh, Facebook page and I think council's page as well, uh, which I talked about Blackley and his experiences. So you can take a look at that uh, again. Um, and that attack allegedly ended in the death of three of the aggressors uh, that night. Uh, local big houses, RIC barracks, army barracks, courthouses, uh, post vans, post offices, all came under attack uh, during this period. And one particular tragic occurrence, uh, which would have uh, had a lot of resonance in Ard Lohar, uh, was the killing of Dean John Finlay, a Church of Ireland uh, cleric, of Brackley House in Bomboy, not far from Ard Lover. Um, and that happened in July 1921. So these sort of things would have been playing in the minds of a lot of local, uh, uh, of the local Protestant community at this time. And uh, the, the tension both between nationalists and unionists, and again within pro treaty and anti treaty uh, forces, this was a melting pot really, which was uh, all building and leading up to the tragic events which took place on the 18th of June, 1922. And although the Civil War didn't begin in earnest really until the 28th of June, 1922, as I say, tensions had been rising between both sides in the run-up to this date, and a level of disorder was beginning to make itself uh, known. The sequence of events in the run-up to and following Madge's death is confused. Uh, and we can gather this when we read the, the, uh, the reports of the killing in the anglo Celt. But as far as, as can be ascertained at this remove, and from a number of various sources, uh, the following took place on the night of the 18th of June, 1922, which is just over 100 years ago uh, from when this lecture uh, goes out. A number of houses in the Ardlover area, all uh, seemingly Protestant houses, were visited that night on the 18th of June, by a group of seven armed men in a motor car, demanding guns and ammunition from the houses. The houses that were raided belonged to a, a man called William uh, Morton, Dan Dellett, Almore Clinty, and Condell Clinty. Uh, James Livingstone's house seems to have been the final house visited that night. And when the men arrived at the Livingstone house, they demanded entrance. This is the house uh, 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 as it stands today, and it's still actually owned uh, by the Livingston family. Now, James's uh, wife, his second wife, Mary, displaying considerable courage, considering that there's seven men outside the door demanding entrance, uh, she went to a window and she demanded the men, uh, you know, what is it that they wanted? And she was told in no uncertain terms 
that, as with their other visits that night to the other houses, uh, the men wanted guns and ammunition. Hearing this, Mary then asked them, what need is there to raid for arms? Is there not a provisional government established? Well, she had a certain amount of guts now uh, 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 doing that. The men outside were not in the mood for a political discourse, and they demanded entry to the property, saying that they had come a long journey. Uh, James uh, was was at the window at this point as well, and he handed out uh, one gun through the window. Now, that didn't satisfy the men, and two of whom uh, James noticed were carrying revolvers. James then handed over an old revolver, which he had held back initially, but that still didn't satisfy the men who were demanding entry to the property. Uh, at some point during the confrontation, Madge, who at this point was 13 years old, uh, she had woken up and gone into her parents' bedroom to find out what was going on. And she went to the small window where her stepmother Mary was standing to look outside. And at this point, four shots were fired by the group of men and a cartridge loaded with heavy shot caught Margaret in the head, which, as the Anglo self reported uh, the following week, caused death instantly, a portion of the skull being blown away. So it was a brutal death. Uh, Mary, the paper noted, who, who had been standing next to Madge, uh, had the, the self said uh, Mary had a providential escape. And she shouted to James, poor Madge is shot, because James had gone downstairs to talk to them, to talk to the men. Uh, the men, none of whom were masked, uh, got into their car and drove away with the two guns that they'd uh, got. So you can only imagine the scene in the house at this point, uh, utter devastation and uh, chaos. Uh, Captain Matthew Gray uh, of Ballyconnell Force uh, received word about the attack at about seven o'clock uh, in, in the morning, uh, the following morning, and he took a car and four armed men with him to Ardloher, where he found James standing on the road. Captain Gray climbed the stairs to find Madge's remains, and he reported in the inquest the Madge's, uh, Madge's remains were lying on her back with her right hand over her mouth and her left arm down by her side. Her head was facing the door. She was lying in a pool of blood. He could not exactly say where the wound was on her head as it was bound by a cloth. So someone had obviously, you know, James or Mary had, had wrapped the poor girl's head in cloth uh, to try and stop bleeding. It was too late. No, no one could have saved her. Uh, her injuries were too traumatic. Uh, Gray called the Kilachandra garrison as well, and Dr. Richardson of Newtown Gore, uh, and the Biltorba garrison were called as well, and representatives from each of those garrisons came out to Ardlover as well. AJ King, who is the Church of Ireland rector of Kildallan, uh, was also one of the first on the scene. And leaving the house, uh, Captain Gray found an empty cartridge on the road. The doctor, Richardson, uh, he arrived at noon and uh, he inspected uh, the dead girl. And at the inquest, uh, which was held that day, Dr. Richardson made the following unflinching statement. This is, is, is quite uh, uh, brutal, really. And it was reported. This is exactly how it was reported in the anglo Uh I was called this morning to view the remains of Margaret Livingstone, aged 14 years. She wasn't 14 yet. She was... That would have been her age at her next birthday. Uh, I found her lying on her back on the doorway of the room just visited. Um, there was an extensive fracture of the skull, the right half being practically blown away and the brains protruding, some brain matter adhering to the walls and ceiling of the room. Death was apparently due to laceration of the brain caused by a gunshot wound. Death must have been instantaneous. So a pretty unflinching commentary there. Uh, in the civil registration of her death, uh, Madge was noted uh, there is there. Madge was noted as being 13 years old and a merchant's daughter. Uh, the cause of death was recorded as being by gunshot wounds inflicted by some person or persons unknown. And upon leaving the house following his examination of Madge's remains, Dr. Richardson also discovered a rifle cartridge as Captain Bray had earlier on. Now, following the tragedy, an inquest was quickly arranged. And as I say, uh, Dr. Richardson, he shouldn't have been, he was a locum, he was only covering the area because the usual uh, doctor for that area, a guy called O'Rourke, uh, who actually signs uh, the, the death uh, register there, even though he didn't inspect the body initially. Uh, O'Rourke was away on holidays. And uh, the, the, the remains had been brought to another house, uh, uh, a guy called Thomas O'Brien's house. He also lived in the locality. Two local justices, a county councillor named uh, Thomas O'Reilly, John Drum, uh, acted as the coroner, and the inquest was held 
in front of a jury at Thomas O'Brien's house where the remains were laid out. The jury was made up of the following men, Andrew Tubman, uh, W. Woods, Alexander Berry, John Lappin, William Nixon, Thomas O'Brien, who owned the house, uh, Joe Crossan, James Abbott, Dennis Murray, Patrick Departlin, and Ben McGuire. Uh, Mary Livingston was called to make a statement, but as the self reported, she was in a state of prostration and she was excused from having to make a, a, a statement because she was obviously in shock uh, as a result of the thing. Having heard evidence from James Livingston, Dr. Richardson and Captain Matthew Gray, the jury returned the unsurprising verdict that Madge had been killed by a gunshot wound. And they made the following resolution proposed by the foreman, Alexander McLaughlin, and seconded by William Nixon. And they said uh, as follows, that we, the jury, hereby tender our deepest sympathy to Mr. and Mrs. Livingstone and view with horror such occurrences in our midst, trusting such steps as may be deemed advisable to be taken to protect the people of the district and ensure peace for all. But as the local Church of Ireland rector remarked a few years later, the Livingstons in those days lived in constant dread and fear. There was no real protection for houses and shops in those days. Madge's death was roundly condemned, unsurprisingly, in the locality where it was noted she was a well-known and popular child. And it was remarked that the neighborhood was horror struck at the crime. News of Margaret's death had caused, uh, as the South reported, a most painful sensation in the Ballycon and Ardlover districts. Father Joseph Brady, uh, the Roman Catholic curate Ballyconnell, was strong in his condemnation of the event, and he remarked uh, that words of his failed to make his condemnation of such an outrage strong enough. He had been called at six o'clock to see the child, 14 years old, again, he's slightly wrong on the date, or the age, uh, dead in her parents' house, and it was a horrifying spectacle. It was terrible to think that men could wipe out the fifth and seventh commandments in their midst and disturb in their quiet and peaceful district by so foul and horrible a crime. He trusted the perpetrators would be brought to justice and that they would receive the punishment they so richly deserved. Father Brady's strong words were echoed by similar sentiments spoken by Father Charles McGee in Kildallan Catholic Church. Other newspapers also picked up the story and were universal in their condemnation on the attack on the Livingstons which uh, resulted in Madge's death. The Larne Times headline about the story read, Murdered Calvin Girl, Arms Raiders Awful Deed. They tell much the same story as everyone else, but they noted the four shots were fired at the house, one of which killed Madge. This report had also noted the Sinn Féin were investigating the attack and the Republican forces are blamed for the outrage, as when leaving, they told the people that the Free State Party would protect them. It's all quite confused. Uh, what's going on, uh, it, it, who, who, who was responsible for this. Uh, the Irish Independent, so it made the national uh, papers as well, the Irish Independent included Madge's death in a column dedicated to the deaths of three people owing to the, uh, the disturbed times. And they wrote that the people are loudly calling for drastic measures to put down this disreputable conduct, which is being made much use of by Ireland's enemies abroad. The Northern Standards headline on the 23rd of June read, Little Girl Shot Dead, Shocking Affair in County Cavan. They noted that the IRA were pursuing clues and hoped to make an arrest shortly. The anglo Celt also mentioned that the IRA were in possession of important clues. Representatives of the Kilishandra and Kurnafain brigades hoped that with the people's assistance, the culprits would be brought to justice, as no effort would be spared to endeavour to track them down. But in a report headed More IRA Crimes, the Belfast newsletter, which was a unionist paper, uh, claimed that the group of men who attacked uh, the Livingstons were a party of IRA. No arrest was ever made in this case, however, and the identities of the seven men who arrived at Livingstone's house that night were never revealed. Now, one would think that surely the Livingstone family had suffered enough at this point, but more, if not worse, uh, uh, was to come. James later applied to the Irish Grants Committee, which was established in London for those based in Southern Ireland who could demonstrate that any losses they had suffered between 1921 and 23 were as a result of their loyalty to the British Crown. Lots of Protestant people uh, applied to the IGC at this time, including, uh, as I said there earlier on, uh, Travers Blackley and his wife. Uh, they made an application to it as well. It was very, very common uh, for this to happen. 
Uh, and according to his application, in which he requested a thousand pounds, James's business was raided a number of times from 1921 before and after the shooting at his premises at home, uh, with goods to the value of ten pounds having been sold in during the raid in 1923. Uh, men's boots, shirts, tobacco, and cigarettes were taken in another raid, and during this raid, focus was kept on the post office and its contents rather than the Livingstone's home part of the building, because as we saw in that earlier photograph, they were joined. Um, but to compound this, following Madge's death in 1922, uh, James's IGC application uh, stated that boycott notices were put up in public places, as a result of which the claimant, i.e. James, suffered a serious loss in his small business. And the premises were raided again, as I say, in 1923. Then in 1926, the house was attacked again with a considerable amount of goods in his shop destroyed and stolen, for which James received compensation of £29. And during one of these raids, perhaps the first one in October 1921, uh, before Madge's death, uh, Livingston had resisted the raiders and managed to keep safe the post office money. James was also believed uh, to have told the authorities the names of the raiders, although there is no proof that he did this. Uh, this, James's solicitor believed, had led to the subsequent attacks on Livingston's premises and the boycott of his business. James received a grant of just over £62 uh, from the IGC, but considering the scale of their losses, I mean, the death of their child, uh, he felt, understandably enough, I think, that this uh, uh, was not enough. And in a letter received by the IGC on the 7th of March, 1926, James wrote the following. Dear sir, your letter and cheque for £62.10 received with grateful thanks. And as we said before, we considered the amount small for all we suffered. How thankful we would be if you would please be good enough to do a little better for us. This was also quite common. You would put in a claim and then you didn't get what you claimed and then you put in another claim and you might get a bit more. It was quite common uh, at that time. Uh, James, has, James followed up that letter on his behalf uh, from John Fagan's solicitors. Or he followed it up with a letter on his behalf uh, from John Fagan's solicitors in Cavan Town. And that recounted all of the misfortunes suffered by the Livingstons from 1921 onwards. Another letter from James to the IGC followed December 1926 by which time uh, the household numbered six children and one maid. And it recounted how our business was named by the IRA Park. We have stuck to the post office and our home at no small sacrifice. Our pay for the post office now is £3.7 shillings per month, which we are largely depending on. So they were in dire straits financially. And having suffered a, a, a dreadful, dreadful, dreadful loss with the death of their child, they're now being boycotted. Uh, you know, which just rubbed further salt into the wounds. Uh, the local Church of Ireland rector, A.J. King, supporting James's application, wrote that Livingston and all the family were and are decent, orderly, inoffensive people and deserving of nothing but respect and duty. James later received uh, in total £375 from the IGC. Uh, following this extremely tense period, things seemed to have settled down for the Livingston family. The Livingstons remained on in Ard Lower, and indeed, as I said a minute ago, uh, a member of the family still lives in that house. Uh, James himself died on the 18th of January uh, 1958, and his second wife, Mary, survived him for almost 10 years, dying on the 7th of May uh, 1968. It is difficult, I think, uh, to escape the conclusion that the death of Margaret Livingston on the 18th of June, 1922, was one of the real low points uh, in, 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 in uh, this, you know, disordered time, this revolutionary time. Uh, her death was likely accidental. Uh, I don't think anyone went to the house that night with the intention of shooting dead a 13-year-old girl. Uh, but that is obviously cold comfort to the family uh, and everything that, that they uh, lost and the bereavement that they must have suffered and the trauma that they must have suffered as well, uh, who had such violence visited upon them that fateful night 100 years ago. Uh, and as I say, the fact that they continued to suffer unduly, almost losing their livelihood due to further raids and boycotts, as I say, rub uh, further salt into, into the wound there. So it's a sad story, really. Um, for anyone uh, who's interested in reading uh, further about this, 
Uh, there, uh, the genealogical information uh, I got from the Roots Ireland website on Irish genealogy and the uh, newspaper reports, particularly the one from the Anglo Celt on the 24th of June 1922, has a very detailed report uh, as to what happened. And they have the records from the inquest. Uh, they basically quote verbatim what happened at the inquest as well. So it's a really, really interesting piece. Nothing really has been written about uh, Madge's death or has hasn't really been spoken about really uh, uh, since then. So there's not really much uh, been done about it uh, up to now. If you want to look at the actual, uh, at a lot of these uh, grant applications to the Irish Grants Committee, uh, they're available through the National Archives in London. And as I say, the CELT uh, is always a great place uh, to find further information as you go along as well. Uh, so as I suppose, uh, just to finish off uh, my thanks, uh, as always, the Calvin County Council, uh, especially the Library Service for their continued support and help, uh, in particular Emma Clancy, Jonathan Smith and uh, Sinead McCardle, who do so much uh, to help me with these as well. And a special word of thanks to the Livingston family who gave me their support uh, and gave me some information along the way as well, especially uh, Nigel Livingston. Uh, so thank you very, very much uh, to them uh, uh, for all their help and support while I was putting together uh, this uh, particular uh, talk. And uh, thank you to you all as well for tuning in. And hopefully I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.